Thank you so much. Uh, well, this is a, a trip down memory lane to be back. Um, it's uh, it's really exciting, I guess, to be back on campus. You know, I've been away for like three years uh, to, be, to give a, an opportunity to really kind of show you a little bit what's been going on. Um, so let's dive in. So what I thought I would do is first uh, kind of like my own kind of personal journey of how I got into automated driving. Uh, what we're doing in TRI's automated driving team, I think we built up an amazing team uh, working in the space. What our approach is to thinking about automation in terms of guardian and chauffeur, really uh, guardian in action, what we've been doing over the last couple of years to kind of realize this. Um, and importantly then, a little couple of uh, kind of research vignettes uh, into um, how we're approaching this uh, and some kind of cool results and then kind of wrap up. So first, I guess my, my personal self journey in this space. Well, let's talk about uh, Amara's Law. We tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Um, and if we look at Thomas driving in the news, Musk said that Tesla drivers would be able to fall asleep and wake up at their destinations using full self-drive by the end of 2020. Uh, another recent article, our own Mr. Uh, Olson. Uh, so the Moore's Law for self-driving cars, maybe this will be called Olson's Law. So if you look at basically the rate of progress that we made from the uh, 2004 DARPA Grand Challenge in terms of how many miles were uh, achieved autonomously, I think we were like seven, uh, to like kind of where Waymo is today in terms of the reported kind of disengagement rate and statistics. Um, what Ed kind of nicely was able to back out is basically you kind of fit basically an exponential kind of growth to this. You see that there's a doubling on about every 16 months, let's say, in terms of a performance and improvement. If you propagate that out, even at that rate of doubling in terms of performance improvement every 16 months, it's still gonna take 16 years to reach human level performance in terms of automated driving, which is up to 2035. And even in this human level performance, the numbers that Ed used for this is I think the 100 million miles kind of between fatality kind of number. And we look at those statistics, that actually is across distracted, drunk, just at all driving in, in general. I mean, if you actually exclude distracted, exclude drunk, it actually gets up to like one fatality for like a billion miles traveled. Humans are really good at being able to drive and be able to handle uh, the everyday stuff as well as the stuff that's not everyday. So my own background, um, I, I'm from Michigan. I uh, went to Michigan State, uh, McKee, and then how I got into robotics, when I was searching grad schools, uh, I thought I wanted to do aerospace and somehow when I stumbled across the webpage for the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program, I saw these pictures of like underwater robots up in the polar ice cap, and I was like, really? You can do this? And so I thought I was doing like Discovery Channel kind of stuff. So that's how I kind of went into robotics and wanting to get in that space. Um, I came to Michigan in 2006, and uh, this was also how I got into cars then, was that this is the time that the DARPA Urban Challenge was kind of happening. And so I'll take a little bit through my history of kind of how I got into there. Um, my area of interest in my group has been like SLAM, Thomas Center Water Vehicles, Automated Driving. Presently, I'm on leave uh, for U of M. Uh, I've been on leave since 2016, 80% with Toyota Research Institute, which means I have 20% here at Michigan. And if you do the math, 80 plus 20 equals like 150% of my time. <laughs> Uh, so my, my background, my, my PhD was in SLAM for autonomous underwater vehicles. This is a vehicle that um, the, the research group I was in at Woods Hole, we built this vehicle, seabed. It was 2,000 meters rated. We would use it to deploy it and do like coral reef mapping, do like seafloor, you know, Bentley kind of mapping the med and that stuff. Um, that's a young Ryan Eustis uh, there in the corner uh, programming this guy. Um, and so w the way I originally was working in is really applications of SLAM underwater. Uh, underwater is like one of those perfect uh, textbook uh, kind of applications for it because we're GPS denied all the time. You either have to deploy infrastructure like acoustic beacons or, you know, we're collecting this type of data anyways for the scientists, right? So if you're working with the geologists like, or the archaeologists, you want to get this kind of uh, uh, imagery of the seafloor. At the same time as a roboticist, how do we think about mathematical frameworks that allow us to accumulate the evidence? Because this gives us basically uh, observability, right? And basically the vehicle's uh, position and state. We have this chicken and egg problem. We have to both build the map simultaneously while we use it. And so some of the, the work that I did in my PhD was kind of large scale demonstration of applying this uh, in the case of visual slam. Um, this was the mapping of the RMS Titanic uh, for which um, that, was, uh, that was an awesome project to kind of be involved with. Um, I came to Michigan then in 2006, started the U of M Perceptual Robotics Lab. 
So there I kind of carried forward the work that we were doing, so projects with the Navy in terms of Thomas ship hull inspection, applying that same type of stuff. Uh, underwater vehicles looking at kind of cooperative navigation and mapping uh, where we have a low bit or low rate uh, data channel using acoustic modems. Um, but really the, you know, the primary background of kind of thinking about, you know, mapping localization, it's really a, a fundamental kind of mathematical framework and backbone. So applying it also to the kind of mobile robotics. So this is a, we had a segue with cameras and LIDAR. We were doing a long-term autonomy mapping. So this is actually a, <clears throat> a map of North Campus where we deployed this robot uh, over the course of uh, over half a year, kind of continuously on campus and be able to build up a map and maintain it and localize. How I got into automated driving. So when I started as a faculty member in 2006, uh, it was serendipity. Uh, I showed up on campus. The Ford was putting together their team for the DARPA Urban Challenge. Uh, Jing Sung, who's uh, currently our chair of Naval, she had just come from Ford recently as a, and joined us as a faculty member. She was like, hey, there's these guys in Ford that are trying to put together this team for their DARPA Urban Challenge. They have this laser scanner. It's called the HDL64 from Velodyne. It's a brand new thing. They don't know what to do with it. Uh, and so I got connected with them, and that's how I originally got into this space. So working with the Ford team, uh, we were one of the finalists uh, in the DARPA Urban Challenge. Um, I then continued for a decade, kind of collaborating with them and also with Ed Olson uh, in this space. So we, uh, our two labs combined really were the, kind of the strong foundation, if you will, for a lot of Ford's automated driving effort. Uh, this is the next generation Ford, Ford Fusions. Um, there's Ed, myself, our colleague at Ford, Jim McBride. So you can see here we were doing the kind of dense, kind of large scale mapping so we could build these things automatically, right? Just drive the environment, build this representation. Uh, and then what you see here is the, the vehicle localizing to this map so you could drive uh, GPS free, right? And kind of really know precisely where you are. You know, th that whole mindset at the time is also one that a lot of the industries kind of followed. Like the idea that can we bake in advance a, a good prior about knowing the environment? Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about just nor nuanced thinking against uh, since then with some of the kind of advances we made in machine learning and what we can actually extract live. Now we don't necessarily have to bake everything into the map in advance. So uh, 2016 came along, uh, Toyota Research Institute was formed. Uh, they had a, a billion dollar kind of investment. You had like Gil Pratt, uh, who was leading the DARPA Robotics Challenge, uh, selected to come lead it. You had like John Leonard from MIT uh, coming to join Russ Tedrick. James Kuffner was like head of Google Robotics. Um, and so I just saw an opportunity to kind of join uh, what I felt was like an A-team. Um, and uh, I took a leave of faith and, uh, and, and joined. So TRI, we have three offices, uh, Cambridge, Ann Arbor, Los Altos, you know, of course, um, located next to our partner schools. And the focus that we have within TRI is thinking about one, mobility at an urban scale. So this is automated driving. The, the kind of division that I lead within TRI. So thinking about both how we make cars safer as well as how we think about giving mobility to those that otherwise are unable to drive. We also think about mobility in the home. This is a robotics effort. So to kind of thinking about um, how we can use robotics, especially as we have like aging society, how can we allow people to really live uh, in place in home and think about intelligent assistance. And then AI for say human amplification. So in our case, we use it for uh, advanced material design and discovery. So how do you search this kind of high dimensional space of like battery chemistries to, uh, to come up with a better battery technology. So TRI Ann Arbor, where are we? Uh, well, I'm talking to you here, right? This is the Eeks building, about seven minutes away, corner of Plymouth and Green, up the road. Uh, we built this you know, pretty nice uh, 60,000 square foot facility. You can see we've got a car, uh, car garage there for about 50 cars. Um, we also just built our own test track. Uh, so this is down in Ottawa Lake, Michigan. It's both on the border of both Michigan and Ohio. Um, basically, it's, uh, we have a large kind of two mile long linear kind of uh, linear length uh, oval, if you will, where we can get the highway speeds, three lanes. But in the center then we put down about 30 acres of asphalt. So this is like a reconfigurable kind of M-City that we can use for close course testing uh, scenario reconstruction. Um, as the other, some of the cool things too is like on this side of the pad, we put down the special genite coating. So when we wet down the track, we can drop the surface mu coefficient so we can really do dynamic driving uh, in that regime. And this is the team. So this is our, uh, our, our on-site that we had in Ann Arbor uh, this past fall. This is actually all the team coming together across all the offices, but being hosted at, at, in Ann Arbor. Uh, we're about you know, 320 people or something like that today, and I lead about two-thirds of those people uh, on the automated driving team. So here's a little bit down history lane. Uh, 
This was Ed and I, uh, March 2016, when we when we uh, joined and started with TRI. This is when we first moved in the office, so you know it's this beautiful space that we live in now in the office. Well, we had to live in 2,000 kind of square feet or 5,000 square feet <laughs> with like 40 people for a, a while, while the rest of the bit place was being renovated. This was a team photo at the end of uh, December 2016, and this was basically the christening now of our garage uh, in the space that we have. Uh, what are some of the first things that we did? So when we first joined uh, TRI, you know, we inherited basically, there was an ongoing effort within Toyota for about a decade, really, in kind of automated driving. There was a small team here uh, in Ann Arbor working in this. And uh, this is on the map shows you the extent of where they had driven uh, during their testing development. Uh, immediately, the first thing that Ed and I wanted to do was to scale things up. And so we, we crafted what we called the Gill One Mill. So basically the 1,000 kilometer kind of challenge. Let's drive all the interstates uh, in Michigan autonomously. Um, and so I'll let this play a little bit. Um, but basically we used both you know, maps that we were able to get from third party vendors, say like TomTom Tom or others, and, and be able to drive on roads that we never driven before, but for the first time, as well as kind of scaling up our mapping framework to kind of create them. Uh, any guess of what you're looking at here? <coughs> It's the Mackinac Bridge. So that's probably, uh, that was August 2016. So I, I speculate, I can't say definitively, but that's probably the first autonomous drive across the Mackinac Bridge. Um, Not the first unconscious drive. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so let me tell you a little bit about TRI's uh, automated driving team. So uh, building a team like this, there's so much that goes into building a large complex system like this. So we have vehicle hardware, software, safety and system engineering, mapping and localization, perception and prediction, planning and control, driver risk assessment. So thinking about how we monitor you know, the state of the driver. Machine learning, you know, simulation, cloud data processing, how we do this at scale in the cloud, user experience, and the vehicle operations. So let me tell you a little bit about the team that I, I've been building for the last three years, because it's a pretty amazing team. Uh, Matt DiNato uh, leads our vehicle hardware team. Um, Matt is a uh, graduate from like WPI and robotics, but he was also part of the DARPA Robotics Challenge uh, with CMU, uh, working on the team. So he leads our vehicle hardware team. This is our platform four that we showed at CES this past January. Vehicle software, AJ Franz. Uh, AJ is actually a U of M alum, uh, graduated in, uh, from computer science uh, here. Uh, he came to us from SpaceX, so he was part of the team that landed the robot, or landed the rocket backwards. Um, Safety and system engineering, uh, Sagar over here. So Sagar, uh, KTH, uh, PhD, thesis working in basically reference architectures for highly automated driving. He was probably employee number three or four at Zooks uh, before he came to come join us. Uh, Ryan Wolcott, another U of M alum. Uh, he was my PhD student uh, at, at Michigan. He leads our mapping and localization effort. Uh, he used to be at Tardac, previously also with the Ford automated driving team. Uh, Bertrand Dulliard leads our perception and prediction. Uh, Bertrand graduated from ACFR, uh, doing a PhD in robotics. Uh, he was at NASA JPL working on Mars rovers and also was an employee at Zooks leading their perception team, uh, parts of it before he came to join us. Planning control, Noel Dutois, uh, PhD at Caltech, um, part of the Caltech's original kind of DARPA urban challenge team. Uh, faculty member at Naval Postgraduate School and then went to Apple special projects team before he came and joined us recently. Uh, Luke Fletcher. So Luke leads our driver risk assessment. This is really how do we understand the driver state because that's an important piece of Guardian. Uh, Luke um, was part of the MIT DARPA, uh, DARPA challenge team. Um, and then um, uh, working on kind of like the driver risk assessment piece, uh, engineer of research science at Boeing that kind of came and joined us. Adrian Gadon, um, he is our machine learning lead. Um, he was at Microsoft Research uh, for a number of years, and then also Xerox Research, and came to join us. Uh, Vangelis uh, Kokovis. Uh, so Vangelis uh, previously used to lead simulation for like Sony, where they were looking on you know like PlayStation 3, and all the physics-based simulation. He was in at Google for a number of years, where he led basically the graphics for like the Chrome browser. He's part of the author of like WebGL uh, in terms of the working committee. committee. Uh, John Voigt, another U of M alum. Uh, John uh, graduated in computer science. He was actually a staff engineer in John Laird's lab for a number of years before he went to SOAR um, and then uh, started LT Field. And then Tiffany Chen, uh, she did human ro robot interaction, got a PhD at Georgia Tech, and then was at Toyota North America working on this before she joined. And then Sharon uh, 
Sharon Chin. Uh, she previously was doing field operations at Google slash Waymo uh, before coming to join us and helping us get started. So I say this because like everything you're going to see here, this is part of a team, right? Um, and uh, so let me, you know, building the team is like a, is a big, is a big piece of what we've been doing. Let me tell you now a little bit about the, uh, our approach to automated driving in terms of guardian and chauffeur. And I think what really sets us apart in terms of what we're trying to do in this space. So first, let me start off. Uh, if you look at news articles, 2017, I, I, maybe this was the peak of hype. So if you look at, I just pulled some of these last night, kind of going back and looking. Driverless cars become a reality in 2017 and hardly anyone noticed. Uh, the year for autonomous vehicles. Uh, yeah, the year of self-driving cars and trucks. Autonomous driving is here and it's gonna change everything. Let's go to 2018, the year self-driving cars met reality. <laughs> uh, home from the honeymoon, self-driving car industry faces reality. Driverless hype collides with merciless reality. Through all the hype, self-driving cars remain elusive. Self-driving car reality check, we aren't there yet. Uh, 2018 was a hard reality check for autonomous cars. What happened in 2018? Um, you continue to have fatalities uh, with like Tesla autopilots. There are kind of high-profile accidents. You had the Uber fatality uh, that happened. You also had uh, the leader, or you know, kind of the imagined leader of the field, Waymo, right, saying that they were going to field autonomous, uh, an actual ride to your service, right, by the end of the year. They did, but it was probably not to expectation, right? There's still human safety drivers in the car. So, what are some of the challenges for self-driving vehicles? There's a lot of the adoption challenges on the technical, technological. You know, economic employment, ethical, legal security, energy, and the environment. But just a huge number on the technical side still. So from a human factor standpoint, when you think about these kind of partial autonomy applications where you think of, you know, the car's trying to drive, but the imagined role of the human is either as a backup or supervisor. That's a huge kind of human factors problem in terms of, like, how do you have a human be engaged uh, in the driving task and be ever vigilant? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the social ballet of driving, right? Trying to do left turns across traffic. That kind of eye contact, that kind of hand motions, really that social kind of ballet of interaction, right, that happens that uh, we take for granted when we drive. Interacting with people, again, in this case, if you can't tell, this is a green intersection light, but there's a cop there doing this. So all of a sudden, green doesn't mean go. Now, it's not beyond our capability, right, to recognize, to write a computer vision algorithm, recognize that someone in a pose doing this, right? We don't want to stop every teenager that comes up to the side of the road and does this. We're really good at artificial narrow intelligence. I, you know, we've made a lot of advances, I think, in terms of being able to have, like, semantic level understanding of objects and things like that and imagery. We're not so good at artificial general intelligence, right? If you hear Andrew Ng talk about how close we are to artificial general intelligence, well, it's... Um, we're as close enough as that, you know, it's, a, it's the same kind of thing as like I worry about overpopulation on Mars, right? We're just, we're that far away in terms of all of that kind of contextual reasoning here of what's going on, right? So you understand that I see the cop. I also understand that there's a subway here and they're trying to level up the traffic, right? And manage kind of the traffic flow. I see the police crews are parked on the other side. All that kind of contextual reasoning allows you to kind of understand and interpret that scene that humans were really good at this kind of stuff. Uh, maintaining maps, um, so you know, maps get out of date. How do you kind of keep them fresh? You know, in particular, like your know, roads get resurfaced overnight, and then you also have like all weather kind of stuff, right? What does it even mean to drive in your lane? You know, um, in a in a road like this, and then of course you know sensing technology, right? I mean, ever better sensors, uh, but importantly, um, sensors that uh, you can afford, right? And so some of that is kind of economics of scale, right? Um, taking advantage of the fact that, you know, the consumer electronics space is how you get kind of economics at scale when it comes to, say, like cameras. How do we do the same thing for, like, LiDAR? So let me take you a little bit about the different levels of automation, the way it's kind of defined. Uh, there's SAE has this zero to five scale. So zero being no automation at all. This is just a dumb car. Um, but you get into level one systems, and those are pretty prevalent today. Those would be things like adaptive cruise control, right, where the system takes on basically the longitudinal driving task. Human's still responsible for steering. Um, you get into level two systems, now the vehicle is responsible for longitudinal and lateral control, right? So it's trying to offer the driver the convenience, right, to say, I'm going to drive for you. However, what's the role of the human? Well, they are the backup and the supervisor of the system. And that has, a, that has challenges on the human factor standpoint. Um, it's one thing for the system to be smart enough to say, hey, I can't drive. 
hand it back to the human, right? But now, um, it can't just work for the 50th percentile. It's got to work for the 5th and the 95th percentile in terms of like the human's cognitive ability to kind of take on the load of the driving task. Moreover, the other huge challenge with it is the supervisory role that you ask the human to play, where the system fails to recognize it's exceeding its operational design domain and requires the human to preemptively be disengaged. So this is, the, this is the challenge of vigilance. So you've seen like some of these high profile kind of accidents of say like a, um, uh, like a Tesla autopilot slamming in the back of a fire truck, right? The human is not playing that supervisory role. They've kind of disengaged from the system. Um, level three, um, th this basically is, presumes that the system can guarantee that the transition time back to the human is some minimum uh, bound of time. Um, in, I think you know, achieving level three is probably as hard as achieving level four, what I'll talk about next. Um, maybe th something like a traffic jam assist uh, could kind of work for a level three where it's slow enough speeds and the takeover is some nominal amount of time. Now, when you get to uh, level four and five, um, human is always a passenger. That is the mindset of what it means to feel a level four or five system. The only distinction between four and five is the operational domain. So in level four, we talk about being restricted, right? So either like geo-fenced, weather-fenced, traffic-fenced. Um, level five presumes you can go anywhere, anytime, right? And we are many, many, many years off from a level five type of system. What are the, some of the challenges of level four and five? Well, it's that most driving is easy, but the hard stuff's hard. This is just an everyday example uh, that I took with uh, driving into work, right? And uh, so I'm, I'm turning into the, this is off Plymouth, turn on the green, turn to go to the TRI and Albert office. But wait a minute, there's a fire truck blocking the, the intersection. There's a police cruiser on the other side. Being a faculty member, I immediately whip up my cell phone and say, I'm gonna use this in a talk someday. Uh, and so what happened? Well, the water main busted at the corner of Plymouth and Green. And so the road basically turned into a river. Now, the presumption of a level four or level five system is I can put my seven-year-old son, Luke, in the car and have it take him to school. He has no responsibility for the driving task, right? So you can feel these systems in a level four kind of mobility as a service. That's kind of where the industry is kind of converging right now. Um, because you, you can kind of restrict the domain. You can also uh, think about how you can use uh, remote teleoperation, kind of Wizard of Odd effects, where as long as the vehicle is able to understand that something's <laughs> abnormal, right, come to a safe state, it does provide an opportunity for somebody, like a human, to kind of teleport in to help with these systems. But that doesn't really scale when you think about personally owned vehicles. So what are we working on TRI? Uh, this idea of one system in two modes. So on the one end of the spectrum is the chauffeur, like we've been talking about, the level four, level five, the car is really the, the driver. Fully autonomous driving systems engaged at all times. Uh, staged commercial release, likely beginning with these shared mobility fleets like mobility as a service. On the other hand, we imagine using this exact same technology stack in what we call Guardian. And with Guardian, driver is always engaged, but the vehicle monitors and intervenes to help prevent collisions. Our goal is to build an uncrashable Toyota. Don't leave the road, don't hit things, don't get hit. And how do we use all of this AI to think about the human as the primary driver, the AI system is ever vigilant in the backup. So it builds on the same hardware and software deployments of our fully autonomous chauffeur stack but we're choosing to deploy it in a different way of how we want to introduce it to the market. Uh, this was at CES uh, this past year. Uh, we talked about Guardian First as being really the strategy that we have within Toyota. And the mindset here is AI guards the human, not the other way around. In those level two, level three systems, it's the other way around. It's the human guarding the AI. Um, and there's a couple of cool things that you get out of this. I'll show you some uh, how this is more than just safety. We can also enhance the joy of driving by having Guardian assist you. So now let me tell you a little bit about Guardian in action. Um, I'm gonna take you through uh, some of the work that we did in 2017 and 2018. So 2017, this was our first time to kind of really begin to introduce Guardian uh, within our research fleet. And this is a team we had basically a, a big kind of demonstration for a bunch of investors for Toyota as well as high level kind of leadership like Akio Toyota and stuff. Um, now here's our unique vehicle that we use for, for doing Guardian. And you'll notice there's two steering wheels here, right? And you're probably like, I thought I was coming to an automated driving talk. Why, why did you guys put an extra steering wheel? And I thought you were going to take it out, right? Uh, well, let me tell you why. So uh, the left, this is the regular kind of mechanical steering wheel that you would have. We could put a safety driver behind the wheel with this, right? And they ultimately, uh, when we're doing testing and development of the system, they can override, take over the system, right? Now on the right, and again, another thing I should mention, this is a mechanical linkage kind of steering wheel, right? On the right, 
what we have is an entirely replicated um, cockpit of a steering wheel, brake, and accelerator, but all of this is drive by wire. What this allows us to do is actually now mux the human input, right, with the AI. So we can actually seamlessly blend the human input with the autonomy. In particular, when you think about Guardian, if I want to do an evasive maneuver to avoid a crash, I don't want to rip the steering wheel out of somebody's hands, right? I could break fingers and knuckles doing that. So I need to be, with steer by wire, I can actually modify and decouple in software in real time the steering wheel angle, right, from the yaw angle of the tires and change that seamlessly. So this is our dual cockpit test, up, test setup. Uh, we patented this idea. This is part of how we kind of use it for testing and development. So first, I'm going to show you Guardian mode. This is from 2017. Um, essentially, what you're going to see here is an important piece of Guardian is not only what the car understands around the world, what does the car understand about the driver and the driver's state, right? Is the driver drowsy? Are they distracted? Um, so what you're going to see here is a, an early version of Guardian where basically it's going to be monitoring driver state and uh, basically um, intervening, first warning, and then intervening on behalf of the driver. So basically kind of like a running hot start, if you will, in the chauffeur. Now we're going to demonstrate our Guardian we're going to emulate what happens when a driver falls asleep. Guardian can tell by using a camera that's part of the dashboard. The camera can even see through sunglasses in order to see what the driver's eyes are doing or if their head is moving into a position that indicates they're not paying attention. So Ryan, whenever you're ready, why don't you go ahead and pretend to fall asleep. <laughs> and now Guardian has stepped in. It's driving the car for you. And now it will offer at some point to give it back to you. Why don't you go ahead and take it now? One of the most frightening things that can happen on the highway is when a car in front of you switches lanes to avoid debris. You have very little time to react because your view is blocked by the car in front of you. We have sensors that can see significantly better than a human driver can see. The Guardian is going to take over where a car switches lanes in front of us in order to avoid debris. Here that car switches lanes, Guardian decides we have to switch lanes also and we avoid having a crash. Now Guardian has offered to hand back control, and Ryan has taken control back of the car. So today you've seen demonstrations of two basic technologies that the Toyota Research Institute is doing research on. This is all part of PRI's work to eventually build a car that can never be responsible for a crash, regardless of what the driver does. So we would call this a version of a kind of serial autonomy, right? So the system is kind of monitoring the driver, understanding if they're alert or distracted, not, not seeing the object that's in path, and the system kind of overriding, kind of taking over. Uh, and for that fall asleep, uh, I did get a cameo appearance on CBS News. I don't understand why you all are in this. This is my claim to fame. Elon Musk certainly does too. Well, people, of course, get tired. Yeah. So they get drowsy. People get distracted. And sometimes people get drunk as well. And that plus, uh, causes relatively uh, tenfold increase in the number of accidents. And so we think that if we have automated systems, there you go. Can see better than people, <laughs> of course, they don't get drowsy or dis distracted, and they certainly don't get drunk. So now let me tell you a little bit what we've done this last year, right? So that was a very early kind of version of thinking about Guardian, um, and really that it's either a discrete switch between the human and the machine. What we've done this last year is really to think about parallel autonomy. How do we engineer the system to really be able to combine seamlessly, right, the control input of the human with the AI to think about don't leave the road, don't hit things, don't get hit. So I built a, a really pretty spe spectacular team to do this. Um, uh, Avinash, Kerry, Selena, a bunch of uh, Chris Gertie students uh, from Stanford that kind of work in the space. Uh, Kevin Zasik, uh, Elias, uh, a student. Uh, who used to be at Toyota, now he's part of the team with us. And so really thinking about how we kind of think of this idea of blended control. So the idea, we're actually inspired by modern fighter jets. So when you look at a fighter jet, when you fly the stick, you're not actually flying the control surfaces directly, right? Um, the vehicle is actually dynamically unstable, oftentimes, especially if it's like a modern fighter jet, right, on purpose. Uh, so that can be highly maneuverable. Uh, but you work within basically a, this dynamic region of stability that the control system is trying to, to keep the pilot within. Now, we're trying to do the same idea for a ground vehicle, but it's much, much harder because for the ground vehicle, the envelope is not just vehicle dynamics. It's perception and prediction and interaction between our ego vehicle and the other agents that are there. So what's really great about the team that we build at TRIs, right, we have all the pieces to put together. I have the people on the 
perception and prediction and the probabilistic robotics and the slam and putting it together with the kind of control theoretic people and the blend of control to really have the full package. So what we're looking here is you know, applying envelope control to vehicles. So we want to be able to de define a desired operating regime, you know, uh, choose a control algorithm that allows us to basically respect the constraints that get imposed uh, based upon what the vehicle senses and understands in terms of dynamics, perception, prediction. Um, be able to intervene minim minimally and then smoothly kind of blend right, the human input with the autonomy. Importantly, we want to give the human as much agency as possible. Right? I want the human to drive. It's only when they get to the boundaries, right, where I want to begin to either through informing and warning them, but then ultimately modulating their input. So we think about, you know, what are the pieces that you have to do to do this? Well, on one hand, the driver's not telling me what they're trying to do. So I have to do this state estimation problem to infer what I think is the driver's intent. What are they trying to do? Next, I have to kind of predict and given the vehicle state what I think the vehicle dynamics are going to be, right? And then I want to we use a model predictive control framework. So we're over a receding horizon. We're trying to basically penalize deviation from the predicted driver dynamics. What's the driver trying to do? But at the same time, subject to safety constraints of how we think about staying within this envelope. Um, and the key, though, is that the way we model this is that the constraints are inactive and the human input minimizes its cost function by design. So the human, really, their control inputs should just pass through the system as long as we're within the envelope. So let me give you a couple of videos to kind of see this in action. Uh, we've been testing at the American Center for Mobility, uh, which is down here uh, not too far away. This is our onboarding scenario. So here you can see we've got a bunch of cones kind of set up. What we ask the driver to do is get in the car. They're behind that second cockpit wheel, right, and say, just go, go nuts. Be, be aggressive. Try to hit things, right? And you can see that as they're trying to kind of hit the boundary, right, the car is going to be working with them, right, to modulate their control input. They also get some force feedback that we can, in software, kind of program through the steering wheel. Because again, this is a steer by wire system uh, that we're developing here. Um, here you can see a visualization of what this uh, dynamic envelope kind of looks like. So this is being sensed by the vehicle in real time, right, in terms of, one, we use the map information to understand, like, don't leave the road. We can superimpose on top of it then the objects that we see in the environment. And then this is combining vehicle dynamics with perception with prediction, right? All these things get mucked together with the human's input to kind of keep them with this regime of safety. Now, here's what's really cool. We can use this to enhance the joy of driving. So what we set up here, this is a slalom course. And we set it up such that if you're the average driver, you try to go through this thing at 30 miles per hour, you just end up hitting stuff. It is really, really hard to make it through. So as you can see here, this is unassisted. As the driver's gonna go through, they're gonna be clipping cones, knocking things over. It's really hard to kind of drive it perfectly. We then turn Guardian on and say, just hit the gas, don't let up, and you drive through perfectly. The system is augmenting the input of the human at all times, right? It's sensing the environment and basically making you a perfect driver to kind of assist you and give you the small inputs uh, to correct. Here's what you see in terms of the envelope. I'll play this a couple times. So you'll see, again, this is the boundary of, like, don't leave the road, right? You can see it's kind of predicting the future. It's sensing the objects in the environment. And those are imposing additional constraints on this. But you'll also notice as the vehicle, so we're going to start from rest. As the vehicle begins to speed up, you're going to notice that this path out here in the horizon is going to neck down. Why is it going to neck down? It was accounting for vehicle dynamics. So it's, it's computing this dynamically, right? And then basically modulating the human's control inputs to keep them within that regime. Now, this time I want to play it again. This time I want you to pay attention up here. Two steering wheels, what are they? On the right, this is the actual steering wheel of the car. This is what the car is actually being actuated with, right? On the left, this is the steer by wire steering wheel. This is the input of the human. And you're going to see that there's going to be times, right, where they don't match. Now, when they're in the envelope fully, they will be fully coupled, right? But as you get to the boundaries, right, we want to begin to now modulate the human's input and correct it such that we can have them drive assisted. And again, this is not a discrete switch. It's all blended, right? Here's how we see it for safety. So in this case, this is a, a pop-out example. So this is, again, using this idea of the blended control. Where you can see here, this is, again, an ACM. We have this guided soft target that's triggered at that tripwire. So as it comes out, right, and our vehicle is now going to do an lateral maneuver to avoid it. And again, we don't have to rip the steering wheel out of the driver's hands because it's steer by wire, right? 
Now we can give them, there's all that kinds of human factor studies that we need to do in this, because yeah, I want this to be intuitive for my grandmother to get in the car and not read a user manual, right, to understand what this feedback should feel like so that they know what's going on and that it feels trustworthy. There's a lot more work we have to do there. But the idea is, how do we really have a blend between human and machine? So uh, next, um, I'll talk just a few kind of re uh, vignettes in terms of uh, how we think about approaching this problem. So um, when we first uh, uh, kind of started up TRI, you know, we inherited this uh, team that had been working on automated driving for about a decade kind of within Toyota. And it was in the traditional kind of framework of thinking about HD maps, thinking about LiDAR, right? Um, and more or less the same thing that the rest of the industry, industry has about kind of been using as you approach automated driving. But when we think about the guardian application, I really want this to work anywhere, anytime. So what should my reliance on maps be? Well, I think I should use them if I have them, right? But I should also have some baseline capability to try to parse the world live to the extent that I can, right? So importantly, thinking about really not just LiDAR, but really there's been huge advances, right, in terms of kind of uh, application machine learning to what kind of semantics you can extract now out of computer vision. It's, a, it's amazing, right? Some, I'll show you some of the results where, like, if you would have showed me those, like, say, semantic segmentation, if you would have showed me those, like, 12 years ago in, like, the DARPA Urban Challenge, I would have said it's fake. Like, there's no way is it that good. You're, you're drawing this in Microsoft Paint. It can't be that good, right? Um, but there's been some really rapid progress that's been made in this space. So I think we have a more nuanced view of how we want to think about and use maps in our framework and the semantics that we can extract live. So we coined, basically, our architecture, robust autonomous driving, incorporating cameras and learning. Uh, we have an acronym engineer on the team, uh, Radical. And so I want to show you just a few things uh, of kind of recent progress and um, some results, both in areas like SLAM, perception, machine learning, driver state estimation, and driver intent prediction. So uh, SLAM, so you know, common approach to the level four, level five. The name of the game is you assume you have an HD map, right? Once you have the HD map and you know where you are in that map, you can encode all the road metadata in it, right? So it's really about expect the expected reason about what's different. Um, and it works really well with the mobility as a service type of application where you can kind of deploy um, that machinery. Uh, however, when we think about Guardian, we really want to extend our framework for thinking about maps. Um, in particular, we want to think about how we can do live perception. So we want to really treat the map as a sensor. I'm going to try to build a world model live to the extent that I can and use the map as a way to kind of boost my confidence in terms of what I understand parse live. So, you know, with chauffeur systems, typically you think about having HD maps. With Guardian, I really want to have baseline level capability. Don't leave the road, don't hit things, don't get hit anywhere, right? And so I may have no map at all. However, there's no reason I shouldn't learn a map through time, right? And when I think about the Toyota fleet, this is part of the Toyota data advantage. We make 10 million cars a year, okay? When you think about that, and our cars tend to last 10 years at a time. At any given time, there's 100 million Toyotas crawling this earth. It's a huge opportunity, right, to think about how these systems can be deployed and learn. And so we think about with Guardian that as we deploy these systems, we exploit the fact that we are trying to deploy this first in, a, in the Guardian mindset of a human as the driver, right? But we can learn through time better representations and actually increase the performance of this system, ultimately also increasing and getting to, we see this as a path to getting a chauffeur quicker than anybody else. So this is a cool result, hot off the press uh, from the team. Uh, this is a, a feature-based map. So we have this kind of factor graph, large-scale backend. Uh, normally, we can build maps using LiDAR, you know, point clouds like everybody else. Uh, what you're seeing here is that same uh, kind of feature-based map that we have in the environment entirely derived from inocular vision. So just a car driving through the environment um, with basically ABS wheel encoder level of information on odometry, right? And we can accumulate that and build up and act just as accurate as we can with a um, uh, high density 3D LiDAR like system. Moreover, then we can use that map to localize. So the video on the right is now showing again just a monocular camera, uh, ABS kind of wheel encoder level of information, localizing into the system. Uh, it's flickering because it's just showing you basically some of the different, so you can more easily see some of the different features that it's tracking. So there's like poles, there's curbs, there's lane lines. Uh, all these different things are being sensed and picked up. And again, here's the semantics, right? Again, if you were to go back to like DARPA Urban Challenge and show me that, I would have said, that's fake. There's no way you're getting that from computer vision. But the world's changed. Um, here's our perception stack. 
so now again, kind of, we have a 360 camera, 360 LiDAR, 360 radar. So what you see is here again, the semantics being overlaid, fused with the LiDAR. This case, this is actually kind of cool. This is actually training, so we have semantics extracted from the LiDAR itself. So in this case, we're looking at range depth maps, intensity, intensity depth maps, and training neural networks to allow us to actually understand semantics, where we can train it using some of the semantics that we learned first from vision. Uh, drivable surface uh, extraction, so kind of understanding. So in this case, everything that's red is you know, above the kind of drivable surface. Um, we then use this to segment, so we get to our object clustering. So now we're beginning to group and kind of track objects in the environment. And this is now tracking, right? So now accumulating those objects through time. It allows us to make trajectories for these things. And then also on the prediction side, right, we want to have some predictive capability of understanding what we think they're going to do. So in this case, now, in this case, you can see that the lip sides are getting more uncertain, right, as you predict into the horizon. But all of this is kind of what, how we think about the Guardian problems, right, is the same way that people think about the chauffeur problem. It's just that we're choosing to deploy it in a very different way, we think, than a lot of the rest of the community or industry. Um, this is some results from our machine learning team. Um, so this is uh, basically, Lifting 2D detections is 60 pose. So in this case, this is again coming from a binocular camera. You have 2D detections, but now we're basically uh, have trained a network that allows us to basically take what we know to be like a, a, a model, right, of a car, right, and be able to um, optimize that model, right, so that it matches kind of the intensity representation in the image so we can actually extract now 3D pose, or 60 pose, let me say, of objects in the environment. So we see down here is kind of the 3D reconstructed scene, again, coming just from the binocular. Uh, we also, uh, our machine learning team, uh, this is uh, another recent result from ECCV uh, 2018. Uh, second place, basically, in the, in the panoptic segmentation challenge uh, there. So this is basically instance level segmentation, right? So what I mean by that is that each pixel is being labeled with what object class it is. So obviously this is like a, a human, right, bicyclist. But importantly, when you do the instance level segmentation, instance level segmentation allows us to actually know unique objects in the environment and establish those boundaries. Um, this is another uh, cool piece of work. Uh, so when we think about the Guardian problem, it's really important that we correlate what's happening inside the cabin with what's happening outside the cabin. So being able to correlate uh, the driver eye gaze, understanding where we think they're looking at so we can build a cognitive model, like a, a heat map, if you will, of the world, of what we think the human's aware of and what they're not. Because again, in Guardian, I want to give them as much agency as possible to drive, right? If the driver's alert and attentive, I'm going to let them get right up to the boundary of the envelope, okay? And just like a pre-crash system today, I would intervene late, and it would be an imminent time to collision. If that same situation evolves and the driver is drowsy or they're distracted, right? There's a huge opportunity to think about that trigger threshold being way advanced in time, first through informing and warning them, right? Ultimately then intervening. So this is just uh, kind of showing once you have these networks kind of trained, um, and typically, you know, we'll use IR illumination, right? So day, night, uh, that's, that's not an issue. Um, and then this is part of that driver state understanding. What do we think they're aware of by correlating where we think the driver's eye gazes with what we understand externally? But then also based upon where the driver's looking, what control inputs they've been putting in the system, their trajectory, right, their kind of history, being able to kind of predict distributions of what we think <laughs> the driver's trying to do, right? And particularly they become multimodal. Because uh, nobody's telling the Guardian system, unlike chauffeur, like or it's just a route planning problem, right? We actually have to do an inference problem to understand what we think the driver is trying to do. As we think about how, when we think about these envelopes, these envelopes are actually multi tubes in space, right? Depending on the kind of distribution of what we think the possible options are that the driver is trying to execute on. So what's next? Uh, let me play this video and tell me if you see anything weird. So this is just, looks like a Lexus vehicle, right? Anything weird? No, I was just pulling a chain. How about now? <laughs> Anything weird? Backwards. Yeah. So 
next advance, right, so I showed you our dual cockpit setup for doing driver wear control. We've actually been working with a tier one uh, retrofitting back into our Lexus vehicle, an actual steer by wire system, so we can actually do a, a real kind of like guardian, you know, not a science fiction car, like a real car kind of implementation of this. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I'm super excited uh, to be leading uh, this automated driving effort at TRI. It's a fantastic team, uh, really amazing set of people. I, I say like, you know, when I was at Michigan, I had a pretty big group. Uh, and I'll have about like 170 people working on the team with me. It's kind of like 170 of my best postdocs and like PhD students that I've ever had kind of working with me. Um, we're really developing this kind of unified technology stack to address Guardian Chauffeur. We're choosing to kind of really deploy this first in Guardian, right? But we really see this as, as, a, as a responsible path to chauffeur deployments. Um, in pursuit of Guardian First Strategy, actually at CES, we announced that we don't want to keep this just to ourselves. We believe in Guardian so much, we want to make it available to the entire industry. So Gil was able to kind of make that uh, announcement at CES. Um, it means that we're going to be open to other partners wanting to basically license or work with our technology because we believe in it so much. Um, we're conducting you know, research across the entire spectrum of automated driving, uh, really to exploit Toyota's <laughs> data advantage. You know, that 100 million Toyotas crawl on the earth at any given time to achieve you know, unprecedented levels of safety and mobility. And we will showcase our research and technology at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, no pressure. <laughs> uh, so that's coming up. So with that, uh, happy to take any questions. Appreciate your attention.